Over the Christmas holidays, I got back to reading the Lord of the Rings trilogy. It's something that I've done a couple of times before. And uh, here we are in February, and I'm just now finishing the last one, The Return of the King. Um, it is the final part of the story. If you've uh, ever watched the movies where Aragorn, uh, the last of the Numenorians, has returned to Minas Tirith and then leads this uh, ensemble cast as they uh, go into Mordor, the evil kingdom to defeat Sauron. You'll have to watch the movie or read the books uh, to really get the full feel of it. But what's interesting is in the final victory as Aragorn and uh, all his buddies Gimli the Dwarf and the four hobbits, Frodo, Sam, Merry and Pippin and Legolas the Elf come to this final victory in the book, there's still a hundred pages left in the book. Uh, and it begs the question, like, well, what else is there to do? Uh, we've won the, the, the big battle. The whole thing is over now. Uh, what do we do next? Even though the battle's won, not everybody knows it yet. There's still evil in the world. But it's passing away, even though it's stubbornly holding on in places. Tolkien was a Christian. And in some respects, he meant for this story to be kind of read like an allegory, or like a parable that kind of demonstrates some Christian principles that exist. He very much had in time this now but not yet kind of Christian eschatology, which is just one of those five dollar words that just means the end times, the way things will wrap up. Tolkien uh, recognized in the same way that Jesus did that even though the victory has been won, we still don't know it yet. Part of the gospel is about announcing the victory. If you read through the Gospel of Mark, you find this really interesting thing where in chapter 1, Jesus begins his earthly ministry by preaching the gospel. And when you dig down and look what's there in chapter 1 of Mark, Jesus preaches the nearness of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God comes near. He isn't preaching some way of getting your sins forgiven like a, uh, a huckster salesperson that's going around selling extended warranties on your car, but instead Jesus goes around preaching the kingdom of God is near. Even though Jesus died 2,000 years ago, the ultimate victory over sin and death has been won, and yet the world is still finding out about it. The world is still learning about the gospel. Aragon and his buddies in the book have won, and yet the world doesn't know it yet. There's a story at the end of the book called The Scourging of the Shire, and it's not included in the films and the movies. Now you might say, well, why didn't they include it in the movies? It's because the movies are already seven hours long. The extended version of the movies are 12 hours long. They ran out of time. The Scourging of the Shire is like a, a miniature version of the whole story told in reverse. Um, at the beginning of the story, the four hobbits leave the Shire to then go and try and destroy the One Ring that gives Sauron all his power. When they've finally done that, they come back home only to discover that evil isn't gone in the world. There's some guy named Sharky and he's got some minions and they've taken over the Shire. They're burning uh, trees and cutting them down and tearing down houses and they've taken the old mill and they've replaced it with a bigger mill that's all full of machinery that pollutes the water and pollutes the air and they're oppressing the people of the Shire. Now the four adventure hardened hobbits arrive and they're not going to take this line down. They lead a rebellion against these guys, Sharky and all his minions, and ultimately they finally establish uh, the king's victory in the Shire. The picture that the Tolkien writes of these last few days, the last few pages of the book, are restoring the world back to the way it should be. Uh, new buildings are torn down, the ones that were built during Sharky's rule. And Sam goes about repairing many of the hobbit holes. He goes around the Shire planting saplings uh, for the trees that have been lost. And he got some magic dirt from Galadriel. You'll have to read this story. 
and he puts just a little sprinkle of that dirt in every one of these uh, trees. The big party tree that's at the center of the, the, the beginning of the story um, was torn down, but he replaces it with a malorn tree that he's taken all the way from Lorien, and he uses some of this magic dirt, and it grows back, and it becomes an even bigger uh, tree than it used to be. So at the end of the book, Tolkien writes that spring surpassed Sam's wildest hopes, and altogether the year 1420 in the Shire Reckoning was a marvelous year. The Malorn sapling, like the ones in Lorien, replaced the party tree. Many children born that year had rich golden hair, and young hobbits very nearly bathed in strawberries and cream, restoring things to the way they ought to be. That should be the way the world thinks of followers of Jesus. Not leading armed rebellion against whatever we perceive to be the forces of evil. I'll have more to say about that perhaps in another video. We are people who know that the enemy's been defeated, though the kingdom of God has not yet been fully established. We are to break down systems of oppression. We are to sit at tables and take a look around and ask the question, who's missing from this group? We are the people who ought to be restoring what is lovely and what is fair and what is righteous in the world. Isaiah 58 has this beautiful picture of what a world like that might look like. Isaiah 58, starting in verse 9. Then when you call out, my God, where are you? The Lord will answer, I'm here. If you remove the yoke of oppression from the downtrodden among you, stop accusing others and do away with mean and inflammatory speech. If you make sure that the hungry and the oppressed have what they need, then your light will shine in the darkness and even your bleakest moments will be bright and as clear as day. The Lord will never leave you. He will lead you in the way that you should go. And when you feel dried up and worthless, God will nourish you and give you strength and you will grow like a garden lovingly tended. You will be like a spring whose water never runs out. You will discover there are people among your own <coughs> who can rebuild this broken down city out of its ancient ruins. You will firm up its ancient foundations. You will be called repairers, of broken walls and rebuilders of livable streets. Wouldn't that be great if Christians were known for things like that? Well, it starts with us. And it starts with right where you are, being a person that seeks out what is right and restores what is lost. Even during a pandemic, there's room to do that.